I'm Jason Berlin, founder of Field Team 6. Thanks for being at this first ever Registered Democrats Summit. And welcome to Fundraising with Grassroots Analytics, Act Blue, and Onward Toward Progress. Super proud of the, the, the group we've assembled right here. Um, if you belong to an organization that wants to start registering Democrats, or if you already do, but you want to expand how you do it, or even if you're just gathering information, you're in the right place. We've got a worksheet for you for this workshop to make it official. We'll put a link to it in the chat. And um, that's for you, but don't hesitate to reach out to partnerships at fieldteam6.org if you have questions. You're here probably because it's very difficult to scale up your organization or just what you're doing personally without coming across a problem that could best be solved by raising money. You might need to buy a pizza so your volunteers can spend more hours volunteering, or you might need to rent a venue so you can get a great band to play for free, get a restaurant to donate pizza and attract hundred more volunteers. Uh, or you might need enough to pay one person so that they can run your group full time. That's a huge step. With more money, you can do more good. Um, when I started Field Team 6, I had no seed money. I put the whole organization on my credit card, which was terrifying. <laughs> and um, we, uh, it worked out great. We, were, we went broke about 36 times that first year. That's just a rough estimate. It was probably more. Uh, but I kept on giving out the link to our Act Blue accounts. And friends kept making small donations, sometimes recurring, that started to add up. And finally, uh, after about a year, it was enough to give myself a survival salary and uh, then enough to hire a friend at a tiny wage who was uh, super committed to the cause. That's Dale Roy Robinson, who's now our COO. And then, then after a little while more, uh, barely enough to hire a young genius, Corey Alpert, who is now our chief strategist. Corey introduced us to grassroots analytics and digital fundraising in general, and the idea also of building a national database of unregistered likely Democrats. Uh, and while Field Team 6 is still, just to be clear, trying as hard as we can to raise money that we need to register Democrats all year, every year in the 12 battleground states this cycle, uh, we're holding this workshop to share some amazing orgs and techniques that can make this process easier for you. So before I introduce the uh, 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 Act Blue Grassroots Analytics, um, I'd like you to understand the extreme fundraising power of a passionate group of activists who are not using any fancy tools at all besides sound organizing principles, a basic Google spreadsheet, and the will to call everyone they know and pitch a cause that means everything to them. This group is called Onward Toward Progress. Angel Trinan is their leader. And they're a group of concerned citizens who, who have wanted uh, to do their part to help save American democracy. And what they managed to do with Field Team 6 is breathtaking. <laughs> so this is a little weird, but I want to do, uh, introduce Angel um, and Onward Toward Progress with a short video I made for them right after the 22 midterms. I love this video. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so here's me on a different screen. Can you feel my body It's Jason Berlin with Field Team 6. And hello to OTP. I'm throwing some Mazel Tov cocktails your way. Congratulations. Oh my God. Look what you did. Your big, hairy, audacious goal was to raise $40,000 for Field Team 6 to help us register 25,000 new Democratic voters in Nevada and win the midterms. You did not raise $40,000. You did raise over 55,000. <laughs> and what that allowed us to do was create a list of 171,000 unregistered likely Democrats in Nevada and contact them so many times we're now on a first name basis. 
These wonderful people received every type of touch point we could imagine. Texts, phone calls, postcards, ringless voicemails, emails, social media ads, even direct mail. This was the most comprehensive program we have ever executed in any state bar none. So now we have to wait for the Nevada Secretary of State to update their voter rolls so that we can check that against our outreach list and we will be able to find out how many voters specifically you helped register and how many actually voted. That process begins in late January. But you saw what happened <laughs> in Nevada. For Attorney General, Democrat Aaron Ford defeated a hyper-racist ultra-MAGA candidate. For Nevada Secretary of State, Democrat Cisco Aguilar defeated a Trump-backed election denier, completing the nationwide route of every election-denying candidate for Secretary of State in a swing state. We did lose the governor's race by a hair, which hurt, and which showed how real the danger is, but this was the one blemish on Nevada's breathtaking results. In ballot measures, Nevada Democrats increased the minimum wage to $12 and added an equal rights amendment to the state constitution. Nevada has three swing house districts that are all true toss-ups. This year, we should have lost all three. We won every seat. <laughs> In Nevada's first district, Dina Titus won by 12,561 votes. In the third district, Susie Lee won by 10,135 votes. In the fourth district, Stephen Horsford won by 10,799 votes. Nevada also had the Senate's most endangered senator. But at 6.29 p.m. Pacific on Saturday, November 12th, I got to send this text to Angel. Can you feel my body shaking? My last breath taken. You swerved my job. Catherine Cortez Masto defeated an election denier by 9,007 votes. That's nine-tenths of a point. Winning the 50th seat and securing Democratic control of the Senate. History... It gave us a, a, a 90, sorry, it gave us a 93% chance of losing the Senate. Together, we defied history. Everything you did mattered. And I can't believe I get to say this again. Onward toward progress. Thank you for saving the world. Field Team 6 loves you. I love you. So happy holidays. Rest up. And we'll see you in 2023. I can't, can't get enough. <laughs> oh, that made me cry again. <laughs> <laughs> all three. We got all three seats. That's insane. That's in and Cortez Masto by a hair. Oh, amazing. Amazing. So, Thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, that this, is, this is Angel Trinan, activist, mom of five, nurse, organizer, fundraiser, and my friend. I'll hand it to you. Oh. oh, Jason, you're gonna make me cry. Well, hello everyone. We'll go ahead and start my deck now. Um, our, our. Um, uh, OTP family loves being a part of the field team six family. Um, so as Jason said, I'm Angel Trinan. I'm the, you know, haphazard founder of, of OTP. Um, I'm a family nurse practitioner here in Los Angeles, uh, working with Latino families and the working poor for the last 30 years. And <clears throat> we started uh, OTP in our family room with 40 of my amazing friends uh, in December after the 2016 election. It was a potluck during Hanukkah and Christmas on a Tuesday night. I invited 30 people and 40 people came. We had a lot of food and a lot of booze and people grieved and shared about their fears and concerns, most of which have come true. And then we got to work. <clears throat> Next slide. 
we started well we we chased around a little bit we, we have a lot of lawyers we helped with the muslim ban we we uh went um we did a little bit of reaction to the Trump administration, and then we decided we needed to be proactive. Actually, going back to the last slide, we started by uh, looking for a swing state. No, um, next slide. We started looking for a swing state. There you go. And um, uh, decided on the 25th, which was our neighbor to the north. Uh, we're based in the San Gabriel, Los Angeles, <clears throat> Pasadena, Glendale areas. And um, uh, decided to help flip that seat. Next slide. We tried to focus on these main principles. We've had three major campaigns, and I wanted to couch everything with this concept of setting a goal, um, Actually, go back to the last slide, um, Annalisa. Where's the one? You're missing this. There you go. That one. Blue. It's a blue slide. One after this, maybe. There you go. Stop there. So we set a goal. Uh, we did lots of homework. So we said, who do we know in District 25? We knew ER physicians. We knew people at the military bases. We knew educators. We did our homework. We found our partners um, and our audience. And we have learned that this should be a living goal based on all of the research and relationships that you establish, but that the goal needs to be clear, consistent, and concise. And then we look for our volunteers, our resources to strengths. And most importantly, we always want to begin, check in, and end with grace, gratitude, joy, and community. Next slide. So when we were looking, one more slide, when we were looking at the next, uh, we were looking at oh, the 25th, there were 30 organizations that were tackling that area. So we didn't want to recreate the wheel. And we found one corner of the district way out in Long Lancaster and Palmdale that had no resources and was getting no attention. And doing our homework, we realized that there were a lot of unregistered Latino voters and disenfranchised Latino voters. And that's how we could help. Mm. So we partnered with the Democratic Club of the High Desert. They really wanted in paid interns for their get out the vote efforts. Um, and we discovered that these potential voters didn't know how to vote by mail or how to register to vote. So we decided to make a couple PSAs as well as Canvas and pay for these interns. Our um, resources and strengths, we have a lot of bilingual volunteers. We have a lot of industry talent. So we could make PSAs at low or zero cost. We had a lot of people who knew how to throw fundraising parties. Um, next, next slide. So uh, <clears throat> we, um, we decided to have an event, a night out. That was uh, Steve Knight was the person we were trying to flip. And we said, who has a big, beautiful home that we can host 200 people? Um, all of these things on this slide, we only raised $40,000, um, which paid for these interns. But all of these things are donated. The amazing graphic design work by our graphic designer, Roseanne Costantino, all of the tech support, all of the food, all of the booze. We saved a lot of money on servers. We employed with for free our children to be the servers. Next slide. Um, and then we created, I don't know where that slide is, but we created these two PSAs. Um, we looked for Latino talent. Um, we knew, we knew someone knew Judge Christina Perez. So she was our Spanish PSA. And then we used Vince Ventresca, an actor for our English PSA. And we found a producer who was willing, Jeff Schaff, to create the um, PSAs and do the coloring and all of that. And then we spent money to buy phone numbers and sent those PSAs to Latino voters in that one pocket of the 25th district. So our next project, our next campaign, 
um, was we looking, we're looking for a swing state and we decided upon Michigan. And that's when we said, who, who can we partner with? And we found field team six. We were targeting you, the youth vote and a, raising awareness about voter suppression. Um, and this was at the start of the pandemic. So our audience was changing. It wasn't local. It was going national. Um, and so next slide, we started, um, uh, we started with a, um, educational program where we partnered with field team six brave new films of with Robert Greenwald and did a screening. It was supposed to be in person. We had to switch it to zoom. Um, and we said, who, who knows a local brewery who has connections? Uh, we've partnered with a local Frogtown Brewery. Um, and then if you donated $150, you were hand delivered by our children again, br uh, beer as well as gourmet popcorn. Next slide. Our next event was a Zoom event, a Be the Light. And um, this was an hour Zoom meeting. We had over 300 people on um, that we all had invited. Um, and we said, who do we know in Michigan? How, how, do, how, do we, how do we get in? How can we help Michigan? We started making connections. We love the Michigan Dems. Everybody we met in Michigan was amazing. Um, so we said, who do we know in Michigan? Bill's fraternity brother from UNC lived in Michigan and um, had a business of Koozie's Famous Nuts, contacted other merchants. So if you donated $500, you were mailed this amazing basket of Michigan goodies. We also awarded our first OTP Atlas Award to Adam Schiff, my boyfriend, and um, we commissioned this piece of artwork for him and presented it to him by Zoom when he was in Washington at the event. Next slide. I wanted to show you these amazing speakers. And the reason why is because other than Adam Schiff, none of us knew any of these people. This is just by asking, who do we know in Michigan? Who's great in Michigan? Barbara McQuaid, we love Barbara McQuaid. Who knows, who knows Barbara McQuaid? Oh, I think my friend went to law school with her. Let me call her. And these like grit and determination and hard work and creativity put together this amazing panel of, of speakers that were so inspirational. We also had Larry Lee, who's a musician and former Detroit Lion. He and his band entertained us throughout the event. We had a silent and live auction during the event. Next slide. And we also did all our other things and we ended up raising $90,000 for Field Team 6 that time. Next slide. Then our most recent campaign was, um, you know, we wanted to save a Senate seat. We wanted to keep the House or flip a Senate seat. So Jason and I brainstormed. I remember talking about Arizona, maybe California, some of the other swing states and decided with my board, with our board and all of our members that we were going to adopt Nevada. Next slide. So who do we know in Nevada? We partnered with Field Team 6 again, then because the nature of this, you know, state of 3 million people with a large population in Vegas was it was very transient in nature. So a lot of people weren't maybe registered in another state, but not there. We had lots of work to do in terms of registering new people. So we committed to Field Team 6 Vision once again and made friends with another Dem club. Um, <clears throat> and this was our first letter writing campaign. Um, so we moved back to the national stage in terms of outreach, uh, but made commitments to Canvas in Vegas there. Our strengths are that we have a lot of amazing writers, uh, a lot of tech experts, a lot of canvassers, a lot of bilingual canvassers, and we were close to Vegas. Um, we also created a professional training campaign because a lot of people don't like to ask for money. They'll invite you, they'll invite a friend to event and let someone else ask for money, but it's hard to ask people for money, especially 
these people that we're targeting because they're already giving money. They're already giving a lot of money to campaigns and ACLU and Planned Parenthood. Um, our joy, gratitude, community piece of this was our partners donated uh, Vegas hotels. We had great dinners. It's a lot more fun to canvas in Vegas than Lancaster. We had emails and Zoom pep talks and a party for the win at the end. Next slide. We did have a Zoom kickoff just in terms of, um, you know, telling our process. So we had a quick one hour Zoom kickoff. We're adopting Nevada and why. And these are some of the slides from that. Um, again, very concise, specific goals. Next slide. What we're, what we're asking, who we're partnering with, how much money we want, what the money is going to do. Next slide. And these were the uh, steps that we identified for someone if they wanted to become a patron. So we could say, you could be a patron. And would you be a patron? Will you ask 10 friends for 100 bucks or 10 friends for you know $200? And these were the step-by-step -step specifics that we worked very hard on that made life easier for everyone involved. Next steps. Next slide, sorry. <laughs> this was our email um, email. I mean, our letter, our ask letter that we spent a lot of time on, we ended up using a branding specialist who um, his fee would have been five grand just to create David Farinella, a Farinella agency. And really, I'm very proud of this letter and we're happy to share it with anyone. It was very concise, very specific, very hopeful. Next slide. Lessons we have learned from a grassroots organization. Um, and we are really grassroots. None of us really know what we're doing <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, uh, letter campaigns for us going, if you remember back to that template with one of the key points, building community and giving hope, the letter write campaign was our least favorite, least the least effective, um, required the least effort but it did lack that, that community hope building. Um, another lesson we learned is it's okay to buck the norm and say, let's just try. We've broken many norms of fundraising and organization and all of that. It's because we have amazing, awesome people. And I think all of you are also amazing, awesome people. And sometimes we get stuck and it's okay to think differently. Uh, the other thing, when Jason asked me to do this, I'm like, Jason, we're not even that great at fundraising. We've only raised you 150,000. But when I looked at it, all of our donated uh, services and intangibles were well over half a million dollars. So then I was proud. Also, there's a time and a season to what people can give. Um, and that's just not financial. It's also some of our best volunteers who have, you know, done so much amazing work have to step back because their mom broke a hip or they have a sick child or something's going on with work. And that's OK. Um, and sometimes I think we get frustrated with ourselves and with other people. But there's this journey of ebb and flow that is to be embraced instead of to be frustrated with. And lastly, um, uh, go back one more slide, sorry. The research shows, uh, you know, as we look from the pandemic going into the endem endemic phase of the coronavirus, there's some profound research that shows that people are needing uh, purpose, connection, and community. And that's crossing all industries. It's costing. It's crossing all cultural and socioeconomic uh, mores and, and variables. And I see this with my patients. I see this with my family. I see this with my friends. And just you know, fortuitously, it has always been our focus. Um, and I think this purpose, connection, and community is what we needed to get through the last administration and come out of the last administration and that it should enhance all of our efforts as we keep going on to save our democracy. Last slide. Thank you, Annalisa, for helping me with the deck.
the end, Jason. That's beautiful. The broken world waits in the darkness for the light that is you. <laughs> you know, I can't prove this, of course, but I do uh, believe we would not have Senator Cortez Masto without without what you did. Um, what you did was amazing. You you amazed me, and so does Onward Toward Progress. Thank you so much for that. It, it's a huge amount and a huge thing that you did. So um, I'm going to, I, I know we're over time. Thank you for bearing with us. It's, I know it's, it's, uh, it, it's my fault. I, uh, the video was too long. I should have cut it down, <laughs> but, uh, but this is so good and so helpful. Angel, is that deck, uh, available for people to look at? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. If you could, um, uh, if there's a link, drop it in the chat. If not, we'll work on that and we could get that. Mm -hmm. Annalisa can probably do that for us. Okay. She's Excellent. got it. Excellent. Um, so I am going to, oh, I just want to say, I hope everyone listening realizes that they don't have to be rich or even know rich people in order to use the strategies Angel did with her group to raise meaningful money for meaningful work. Those principles work amazingly. Um, now I'm going to turn the rest of the workshop over to our chief strategist, data guru, and fundraising expert, Field Team Six's very own Corey Alpert. Hello, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Corey. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, my friends over at Grassroots Analytics. They are our partners in helping us do a lot of our fundraising activity. Uh, so first up, uh, we have two uh, great folks. First up is Jesse Koch, um, who has served on both statewide and local campaigns in her home state, spearheading fundraising uh, and working with the finance team, which for those of you who don't know, finance in campaign world means fundraising. Uh, Jesse's passionate about political outsiders, flipping red states blue, and strong female candidates. And we have Krista Chakraborty, uh, another fundraising strategist at Grassroots Analytics. Uh, prior to being at Grassroots, Trista has worked in local, state, and national campaigns, uh, mostly in the Midwest. She's devoted to fighting for the rights of underserved communities, having spent the last year in a leading role of vaccinating and advocating for the homeless uh, during the pandemic. She's conducted research in cancer-related immunotherapy, labor economics, and social justice movements. She's committed to elevating the voices of minority groups and propelling candidates and organizations that make a difference in their community. We are really, really grateful to have uh, two great friends from Grassroots Analytics. I'm going to shut up and let them uh, take it away and help you all uh, build out what uh, your fundraising, fundraising strategies should look like. Great. Thanks so much, Corey, for the intro. Um, we're going to kind of get started by talking more about what we do here at Grassroots and a little bit more about our services and our offerings and different ways that we end up working with candidates and organizations across the country. Um, so just to kind of get started, uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so some of the things we're going to go over, overview of Grassroots, um, different ways that we're able to utilize our data in our database. And of course, the fun parts of fundraising that we end up working with candidates and organizations on, such as call time, email programs, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and fundraisers. So a brief um, overview of Grassroots. So we started back in 2017 um, and started working with campaigns all across the country to provide various types of fundraising services. On a day-to-day, -day, both me and Jesse work with campaigns um, across the country to provide support in terms of strategy and data and making sure that they're able to gain as many Grassroots donors as possible. We provide support in terms of call time, email, and all things in between um, in the also in terms of like the different types of candidates we've been able to work with we were able to work with Maxwell Frost Mary Patola and several other amazing candidates across the country and one super major way that we're able to work with people um, is with our data. So we have over a billion, billion data points and nearly 30 million donor profiles in our database. And this helps us create pretty targeted donor lists for our candidates and organizations that we work with. We use various types of predictive modeling, donors' previous giving history to kind of make different donor profiles and try to put together their background demographics and things like their top issues, the things that they care about. Um, and in terms of some 
uh, some other examples of our hyper targeting. So we can uh, pull data or lists um, for candidates and organizations based on their top issues. So donors, if you know, if a candidate or organization is looking for donors who care about the environment, care about criminal justice reform, care about getting out the vote, we can also do you know donors of Bernie Sanders donors or um, Joe Biden donors, or even get nitty gritty with statewide local candidates and campaigns. We can also do. Um, like PAC or organization donors. We can also do um, a list based on geography, date. We can get as nitty gritty as specific zip codes in a neighborhood to like nationwide donors. And then in addition to that, we can make sure that um, don't, uh, all the donors in a given list have given a certain amount or have a certain contribution average. Um, and then along with that, making sure that they've given previously to federal races, statewide races, local races, and also ideologically align with the organization or the candidate that we're working with. Cool. Thanks so much, Trissa. So um, I'll talk very briefly about some of the services that we have at Grassroots that would apply to all of you. We, of course, have our full service programs, which is both data and consulting or just data. Um, you get access to our entire database as well as a fundraising strategist fit to your region. So it could be Trissa or I or one of our other fundraising strategists here. Essentially, we're just here to be thought partners, help you raise money, send you your data and keep your organization and your data organization all up to date. As far as acquisition services go, we do all kinds of really cool, crazy things there, including direct mail, texting, uh, email acquisition, call time acquisition. And if you have like email that you want to be reactivated, people who have maybe fallen off of your list or you think they have updated emails, we can do that as well. And the last thing that I'll just mention is as we're coming into 2024, it's really important to kind of keep these things at top of mind right now because starting early is only going to benefit you in the long run. That all being said, I will switch gears to uh, talk a little bit more about how you actually raise money. So Jason so wonderfully mentioned earlier about calling all of his friends and asking them to donate. And that is exactly what call time is. It is the fastest and most cost-effective way to raise money for a campaign or an organization. And this can look different depending on what your organization looks like. Maybe this is you, the president, the CEO, the founder calling high net worth donors who can give uh, whatever your state's or the federal limit is for fundraising in your area. Or this could be volunteers or organizers calling frequent small dollar donors and asking them to volunteer and throwing a donation ask in there as well. It really is just going to depend on what you're looking for. But what's um, most important... I just want to uh, jump in to say we're extending these so you don't have to, um, you, you know, you can you can fit in whatever you need to. We're extending this just to 440. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So when it comes to call time, you're going to want to have materials. So I always, always recommend having a third party number, whether this is an additional phone, a burner phone, or just getting like a Google voice number. This keeps your personal, your personal phone number private. It also keeps your personal number as being flagged from spam and can also help your uh, third party number being flagged as spam. And then you can also have multiple users, multiple people using the phone, multiple people answering the phone, all that kind of thing. A dialer is also really important. This will auto call people for you so you're not sitting there typing in the number. You can also auto send voicemails and follow up emails and texts, which just makes your life a lot easier and you're connecting more in the time that you're putting into your call time. And then last thing, the most important thing is your call time lists. These are curated lists with your thousands of prospective donors. But what do call time lists look like? What a great question. Uh, this could be your personal network, like Jason mentioned. It's people that you know that you're calling and getting amped about this project that you're working on, this organization that you're working for. These are people that are just most likely going to already be kind of keyed into what you're doing. Then you can get into people that are donating to aligned organizations. They are ideo ideology, whatever. They align with you. Um, and they're just more willing to donate to your campaign because they feel the same way you do or your organization. And then Axe to Grind, these are the like, you know, um, anti-Ron DeSantis people, um, if you're working for that organization, people that dislike your opponent, so would be willing to donate to you and your organization based on that. But no matter what, you should always be going back and calling through your list because if someone doesn't pick up one day, maybe they will next week. Maybe if you call them in the evening and they don't pick up, but you call them in the morning, they will. You should always call back through your lists. 
Um, great for grassroots analytics, our lists are highly targeted, like Trissa was talking about earlier, with your prospective donors based on what you're looking for. And a good list should always have, you know, first name, last name, contact information, employer occupation, where they live, and then a bio. Bios are the most important part. This tells them how much money that they, you know, they give per cycle. This is how much money that they estimately, you know, could give you and your organization, other things that they support. This is what our bios look like for grassroots. It tells you, you know, all of the issue contributions. These are nonprofits or organizations that these people have donated to, but also house contributions and recent contributions that are just important to know when you're making these calls. Um, cool, I'm gonna switch over to email programs. Um, this is also where getting started early really, really helps. Email programs are a long game. You want us to be slow and steady and you wanna start early. First and foremost, email fundraising is most affected by your deliverability. If your emails are not getting into people's inboxes, they're not clicking them, they're not looking at them, they're not donating. That is the most important part. This is why starting early matters. You can slowly build your organization's email program over a long period of time so that when that crunch time in 2024 comes, you've already got good deliverability and you've got an engaged audience that you can work with. You never, ever, ever want to accidentally get your domain into spam. Your open and click rate should always be around 20% at a minimum. Um, and again, deliverability is just important because it means that people are seeing your emails, it means they're clicking your things, and it means they're donating. I'll go very quickly over some good copy, and we will make these slides available for you guys afterwards um, if you want to peruse them in their more specifics. First and foremost, when you're writing good email copy, theory of change. Why is it important that a person contributes? Why are they, why should they give their hard-earned money? during these high prices to your organization? What is the purpose? What are they changing? Next is an urgency, whether this is like a external deadline, the FEC, end of month, end of quarter, you have to report numbers or an internal deadline. You need to raise a thousand dollars by midnight or you won't be able to put in an order of lawn signs or you won't be able to hire the new organizers you wanna hire next month. Both external and internal deadlines can be really important in motivating people to give. I know so many people, so many people in my network that will open an email and say, oh, I'll remember to look at it later and then never do. You put a deadline on it, they're more likely to donate right then and there. And then lastly is the call to action. This is kind of like the ask. It's the most important part of the email. Um, if you don't actually ask for money, people will not give it. It's just, if you don't ask, you won't receive. You could phrase it in any different types of way. Will you donate? Will you chip in? Rush $5 right now. It's all going into all the same stuff, which is my favorite part, be strong ask. Put a number on your deadline. Say you need to raise this much money. Tell them exactly how much money they need to give you before that deadline. And then fill out the consequences. This is that call to action. If they don't do this, what doesn't change? Giving people a deadline and a motivation and exactly what they need to do to help you is always going to be just incredibly helpful when it comes to email fundraising. Um, all that being said, I will pass it over to Trissa to wrap us up with peer-to-peer -peer and events. Yeah, thanks so much, Jesse. So moving on to other forms of fundraising, something that we were able to see a lot of success on and also do in-house at Grassroots is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So this is a great way to kind of reach out to more of your low dollar donors via text. Um, and to get started, a couple of things that you need here. Uh, Jesse, if you want to go to the next slide. Yep. So, oh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so to get started with peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you essentially need a texting platform. A couple of things that we've seen a lot of success on is things like Scale to Win, Politics for Wired. And then of course, you also need compelling copy, similar to what Jesse had mentioned for email copy. Um, we, you also need compelling copy for texting. And then of course, you need a targeted audience, whether that's your current donors or even mm. prospective donors. And of course, a donation page, whether using AppBlue or something else. 
So what are important components of peer-to-peer -peer text copy and how to write tech peer to peer text copy. So first thing to keep in mind is the length based on your goal or deadline or ask, you can have your copy be long or short, as long as you're getting a, a couple of other important components. Then um, another thing to keep, keep in mind is the sender or the voice of your copy. You want to make sure it's somebody who is a notable sender who has name recognition or can add personalization to the uh, text that you're sending out. Um, in addition to that, things that help a peer to peer text copy are images, having bright images or snapshots of your organization or candidates work is very important to catching the attention of a reader who's reading your text. And then also there's the types of asks to include in a copy. So there's, of course, the donation ask where you're making a hard ask asking for money, or there's petition ask where you're asking voters or supporters um, and trying to engage them by sign to sign something or get out the vote. Some other things that you need uh, for a successful text copy are goals and deadlines, similar to email, similar to even call time. You want to make sure that you're really emphasizing the urgency of giving. So whether you're including like, you know, we need to reach this goal by midnight or we need to make sure that we're raising set exactly this amount by this date is super important. Uh, important increases that urgency for donors to give. And of course, there's the theory of change, making sure that you're making the donor feel like their donation will make a difference, that they specifically need to donate to this cause to for a specific reason, whether that's like supporting an organization that's super important, or making sure that you're kicking someone else, um, kicking a Republican out of office. And of course, very, very important is to include the correct link. Um, so always making sure that you're including the donation link and you're also checking it multiple times to make sure it's the correct link. And that we, I won't read over this completely, but this is a sample of a successful uh, text copy. So a couple things to highlight here. Um, we kind of had the personalization token where we're using their first name. We have a sender um, or, or like a notable person who's sending the email or sorry, the text. So Ben Wookler. Um, and then there's also like kind of the theory of change where you're talking about how their support will be so important for uh, to give in this moment. And then there's also the hard ask at the bottom there where you're kind of asking, can I count on you to make $25 donation today and adding that sort of deadline? And then, of course, the link. And then, yeah, in terms of audience, and this is kind of where grassroots comes into play as well, where we're able to do those hyper-targeted donor lists. So you do want to make sure that you're testing variety of different audiences to see what works for your organization um, or what works for the candidate, making sure that you're doing things like A-B testing to see what works, what doesn't work, what's a good time of day to send text to your specific audience. And um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of texting and emails and things like that are geared towards low dollar donors rather than high dollar donors that are specifically reserved for call time. And then overall, just to kind of whiz through best practices for um, sending peer-to-peer -peer texts, making sure that your copy has deadlines, goals, making sure there's that theory of change, um, why like responding to that call to action is important, making sure you have that link. And then also, you know, making sure the frequency and scheduling of your texts are very intentional. You don't want to spam somebody with texts over and over again, but you still want to like try to engage that donor in one way if they're not responding to one text, but they might respond to another text. So making sure that, you know, it is trying to, you are trying to still build a relationship with this donor um, through text. So trying to be respectful of their time, but also trying to get them to give if they can. And for our last kind of mode of fundraising, there's fundraising events. So fundraisers are super important for candidates and organizations to build rapport and strong relationships and also build stronger relationships with high dollar folks as well. So to get started with fundraisers, um, one thing that we always tell our candidates and orgs that we work with is that you really do want to establish purpose and make sure that the fundraiser is worth having. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah. So establishing purpose. So you want to make sure that every fundraiser you do, you are, you have a fundraising goal and that money is coming through the door and it's worth, uh, worth your time. You want to make sure that you're reaching a new audience of donors, a new network of donors that you may have not tapped into in the past. Um, also looking into your own organization or candidates donor networks to see if there's a host um, who would be willing to host an event that would bring in a lot of money. And then also making sure that you're maximizing the event, whether you're, hosting the event during a pivotal moment, whether it's the launch of an organization, launch of a campaign, EOQ, elections, get out of the vote, anything in between. And then, of course, if you do choose to move forward with the fundraiser after setting your expectations and establishing purpose, you want to set expectations with the hosts for the fundraiser, making sure your hosts are high dollar donors and are willing to give to the campaign or organization or, and are also willing to invite their wealthier extensive networks to the event to bring in more money to the event. And then also assigning things like what we've seen a lot of success with, with our candidates and uh, orgs or assigning host tiers. So making sure the main hosts are like $2,900 or above, and then kind of going step by step below. And uh, just to kind of sum up successful fundraiser tips and tricks, making sure you have a fundraising goal, and then you're also tracking the progress towards that goal, making sure you have your hosts and you've communicated your fundraising goal with them. You have your date and location locked. You also have things like an event page, a source code, a Euro, an ActBlue link or URL specific to your event so that when people are donating, you're able to track their donations specifically. And then also having some sort of invite PDF to share with folks as they're hearing more about your event. And then of course, what's really, really important to make sure that people turn out for your event, specifically high dollar folks. So making sure you're doing outreach for the event, whether it's you as an organization or the candidate or the hosts, and you're reaching out to your high dollar networks via email, call time, or any other, you know, text or anything else in between, making sure you're keeping track of your RSVPs, making sure your event has a run of show, and then also making sure that, you know, you're keeping track of folks who are coming in the door, giving at the door, or making pledges throughout the event, and that you're pledge chasing afterwards if they haven't given at the event. And of course, lastly, making sure that those high dollar folks you're sending a personalized thank you call or email directly. But yeah, that kind of sums up um, a lot of the things that both Jesse and I do on a day to day in terms of strategy and support for a lot of candidates and orgs. And uh, we open up the floor for questions. Yeah, so I was keeping track as you guys put questions in the chat. So first, um, Kathy asked, we hear so many people complain about the Dem Nancy Pelosi emails with harrowing headlines. I hate those and delete them immediately, but maybe they work. What's your take? Um, I think it really depends. I think a lot of people just in general, especially on the Democratic side, have seen a lot of donor fatigue when it comes to emails. So that's why getting started early and maybe the first few emails that you send to new people are just, are just you know, here's who I am, maybe not asking for money yet, but like sign this petition or sign up here to do this instead of asking for money to get that open rate a little bit higher. And it really depends on your audience and the audience that you're going for, going for. The thing about Nancy Pelosi is that they have such a huge program that they're emailing millions of people all the time. So they're less worried about, um, the, they're less worried about their open rates, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would say like, you know, grassroots, we end up working with some of those smaller candidates and organizations. And we definitely through our, you know, um, digital services try to offer more, uh, I would say emails that are led with more empathy and more like personalization and trying to try, uh, relate to the donor and appeal to them through like an emotional lens rather than like, if you don't give now or else, you know, like more threatening tactics. So we're able to utilize a little bit more of like, an emotional approach rather than more threatening approach. And I feel like we've seen a lot of success with that, especially for a lot of these candidates and orgs who are just getting started with email programs and just trying to get their name out there. We try to make the engagement a little bit more meaningful. Uh, cool. Next, we had an ask from Mary Lou. Do you factor in donation limits? New York has limits to what individuals can give to campaigns and committees. Yes, we do. Um, our ask amounts are usually based on 
by default, they're based on the FEC ask limits, which were 2,900, are now 3,300, I believe, um, per election. So we, but we also have the ability to customize those ask amounts. So like, for example, if you are running for state or local office in Maryland, the limit is 6,000 at any point. So we can customize our list that we send to our organizations or candidates based upon those limits. Yeah, that's perfect. Cool. Uh, Michael asked, how do you add urgency if you don't have filing deadlines or an election schedule to work against? Trissa, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So honestly, I would say like sometimes you might just want to, I don't want to say make it up, but you might just want to just like put into words like what you do with that money. So you can even add things like, you know, if you send me money by like this date, then I will use this um, amount to organize canvassers or I'll use this amount to hire my finance director or things like that. So you can even add urgency in terms of like, I need to staff up. I need to make sure mm. that I have enough staff to get my name on the ballot, um, things like that. So even if you don't have like specific filing deadlines or election schedule, you can add more urgency based on like, you know, making sure that you're getting enough staff in the door or you're, you know, purchase or you're ordering more literature or you need this many supplies for your campaign and things like that. Cool. Last ask that I saw in the chat was from Michael and he asked, what is a run of show? So a run of show is basically your schedule or like your TikTok for an event. So you kind of go through like the schedule of like, for example, if you're doing it for a fundraiser, the fundraiser six to eight, kind of mapping through what is happening during that time. So for example, we'll have like 5.30 to six, check-in table is set up, six through 7.30, you know, folks are checking in. These are the people who are assigned to check in people and make sure that you're showing the act blue link to folks. And if you do have like your candidate or somebody from your organization speaking, make sure you're including that, make sure you're including setup and cleanup time and anything in between, essentially your schedule to share with everybody in the team. Perfect. And I did, I, I told a little fib. I was wrong. It was not the last question. Uh, the last question comes from Karen. She says, what are the best practices for integrating fundraising emails with volunteer recruitment and updates? I've heard so many voters complain, especially base voters about millions of fundraising emails that then cause volunteer asks to get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, so I would say, um, and Jesse, you're welcome to jump in on this. So for fundraising email, I think for fundraising or for email programs in general, it's very important to have at least some form of fundraising component. If you are trying to do more information-based or volunteer, volunteer updates or recruitment-based, it's okay to have the fundraising ask at a more maybe like muted level at the very bottom of the email where you're still including the buttons to donate. You're still kind of including a link like, you know, you can't volunteer. Do you want to get involved in another way? And of course that link is to the act blue page. So of course, if you're trying to share more information or trying to send more updates or things um, that are not fundraising related, it's okay. We still recommend still having a fundraising component in every email that you send, but just send including it in a muted way or really emphasizing like, oh, if you can't volunteer, here's another way to support us. And then, you know, making sure that's fundraising. So I would say like still adding it, but making sure that your information is also getting relayed. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is like, it's a little clickbaity, but you can always make your subject, this is not a fundraising ask or something like that. And sometimes that just gets people to open your emails a little bit more, which can be helpful when you're making those, like what Trissa was saying, those muted asks when you're really looking for volunteers. That was so great. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Super helpful, useful presentation. Amazing. We will certainly be sharing those slides and we'll, uh, that last slide has both of their contact information and we are so, so grateful to our friends from grassroots. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to Jesse and Trissa. Um, so they mentioned Act Blue, which is how we and most democratic campaigns and organizations process donations. So now we're going to hear quickly on how to set up your own Act Blue account. Uh, so I'm going to quickly introduce uh, our two friends from Act Blue, uh, including Santiago Orozco Aviles. Uh, 
uh, an outreach associate at Act Blue. Santiago is a queer disabled Chicano from Houston. They're a community organizer and digital fundraising strategist with a background in nonprofit fundraising and grassroots organizing. They currently work as an associate on the movement issue and charitable organizations team at Act Blue. And in that role, Santiago works with movement building and civic engagement nonprofits to build sustainable digital fundraising programs. And last but not least, uh, our uh, outreach associate who works with us most closely here at Field Team 6 uh, is Ash Sharma. Uh, Ash is an Indian woman from North Georgia working with political action committees, including Field Team 6, at Act Blue to aim uh, to run grassroots low dollar fundraising programs. Prior to Act Blue, she managed a $100 million campaign compliance program for a U.S. Senate campaign and gained extensive experience as a fundraiser for a local legislative race. She has also served as an assistant to the federal and gubernatorial campaigns department at Emily's List. Ash and Santiago, thank you so much and take it away. Thanks for having us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hi, all. I'm Ash, use she, her pronouns. That was a great intro, Corey, thank you. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get us started. I know we have five minutes. So quick intro, ActBlue is a nonprofit that builds tech and infrastructure for democratic campaigns, progressive aligned ca causes, and people trying to just make an impact in order to fuel long-term people power change. We are the money raising platform through which people are able to create change in their communities and democratize power. We're excited to give you a five minute rundown into how ACWU could be helpful in digital fundraising and how to get set up. Before we get started though, you might be wondering what do account managers like Santiago and I do here at ActBlue? Uh, well, we can help you make the most of our tools, share best practices, help you analyze your donor data and be a sound sounding board for you and your digital uh, fundraising ideas. We're a great resource for y'all to utilize once you're set up with your account. Um, and just ActBlue in general, we've been around since 2004. We've pioneered digital fundraising since then. And a lot of big fundraisers, as we've talked about earlier, have all been on ActBlue as well. Um, digital fundraising is basically essential to all like fundraising efforts these days. So uh, it's just, what is it? It's just a great way to leverage all your digital channels, such as e email, social media, in a collective strategy to drive small dollar donor engagement and increase donations. Um, so moving along. Uh, so why use ActBlue? Small dollar donors have gone given over $11 billion to groups in ActBlue since 2004. Uh, the average contribution size for campaigns has been $44.31. There are, just to highlight, there aren't any contract or hidden fees. There is a credit card processing fee, which is often attached to any uh, payment processor. Uh, and most groups can get started within 24 hours. And we have thousands of groups that trust us. We have more than 22,000 uh, to process the small dollar donations. So moving along. Uh, I'm going to kick this off and then Santiago will jump right in. Uh, some important features that we think will be important to your work. We have digital wallet options so folks can pay with like Venmo or Apple Pay or um, we have Express Lane as well. Uh, folks will have access to expert digital fundraising support so people like Santiago and I. And then we'll have unbeatable contribution forms. And I'm going to pass it over to you, Santiago. Thank you, Ash. Um, some of the other features that we want to highlight are because there are so many organizations that end up being in the news cycle, our tools really are built so that you can meet the moment and, um, you know, take advantage of the momentum that your organization gets in those moments in order to bring in new donors and supporters. Uh, we also know that not everyone is a tech or data wizard. And so we do have a lot of built in tools to our platform that make it really easy for you to you to analyze your fundraising. And we also have uh, reporting that's uh, available from the account manager that works with you. We also have a feature called supporter forms, which makes it really easy for you to do things like peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers where you're activating your community. And one of the great things about ActBlue's accounts is you from day one have access to all of these different features we talked about. Um, None of these features are paywalled or anything. All of this is available again with your free account. And if we could go to the next slide. 
ultimately our bread and butter is going to be our contribution forms. These are the donation forms that someone goes in order to fill out their donation information. And with an ActBlue account, you can create as many of these forms as you want. You can share them on social media. You can add a donate button and have it link back to ActBlue. And you can add that donate button onto your website. So it's a really versatile um, tool that you can use. I've even seen folks send out ActBlue links over text message in order to fundraise. And one of the things that we do take really seriously is that everybody is on their phones these days instead of being on computers. And so all of our forms are optimized so that if someone opens it up on their phone, it loads beautifully and efficiently. Um, and if we go to the next slide, the other thing that we want to share with y'all is we do have personalized support for every organization on the account. As Ash mentioned, both of us are account managers, and there's many organizations with uh, that we have calls, um, regular calls with, where we talk about digital fundraising, how to get the most out of their account, and resolve any questions that they have. And on our last slide, uh, we just wanted to make sure that we share out our contact information so that if you do have any questions about ActBlue and how to get started, we can definitely help you out. Yes, and I can also drop our setup form as well. Um, it's just like setup at ActBlue. <laughs> uh, but it, it once you like fill out a form with, quickly, you'll hear from someone and you'll be your next steps happen like pretty quickly. So we're just pretty close to, <laughs> we're, we're always just one email away. And you can always email us directly if you have any questions. Well, thank you both so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, again, for everyone, we will be sharing uh, those slides and we'll be sharing uh, Santiago and Ash's contact information uh, as well. Uh, look for that over the weekend or early next week uh, in an email from us with all the slide decks and all the information that have come uh, over the last uh, full day. So now we're gonna head back to the main stage for our final farewell. Uh, we have some raffle items to give away. Uh, but again, thank you uh, to Ash and to Santiago uh, for uh, helping us out here and helping everyone get set up on Act Blue and for helping Field Team Six. Um, so thank you all so much. We'll see you on the main stage in just a minute.